Vote one, two, can announce the, we'll announce the date. Oh, uh, today's uh, <coughs> August 23rd, um, and it's 6.06. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so we can go ahead and call roll. All right. Um, Mr. Seward? Here. Ms. Yates? Here. Chair McLaughlin? Here. And I'm Laura Turway. And Christina Robertson, Gardner Staff. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, okay. So, uh, Ermitter, Ermitinger house update. And I suspect Cindy's around here. I saw her car. She's got to be showing up in the dark. I would assume it's going to be here. I think one of the things is his. So, um, so anyway, the first item on the agenda. Sure. Um, there is requested each month to provide the Stroke Review Board with an Irma Tanger House update. And this month I have some more information to add. So I'd just like to kind of give you an update of the since the last meeting, which was in June. Uh, the city um, manager and um, community services manager Scott Archer and Denise Kai have been meeting with lots of groups. Um, initially, they've been still working with the city of Portland to see if um, they'd be interested in, in providing some matching funds. Um, they're still working on that. Uh, they are looking at potentially some community development block grants to Clackamas County this next year. Uh, and uh, they have directed me to help with grant applications. So I've just recently applied uh, for a, um, a grant with, uh, I just forgot the name, right back, uh, <laughs> with a, 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 a historic preservation grant. Uh, local pro program and then I will be applying for the um, certified local government uh, program uh, through SHPO for um, National Register Properties as a, a bricks and mortar uh, grant. So those two grants will be applied for this fall. Uh, what we're looking at doing is breaking it into phases and phase one is the ANI, the architectural engineering and the plans and the specs. And so that's what we'd like to move forward this fall with. And hopefully the, some of those grant plus the $100,000 uh, the city has put aside in their general fund for this next year will it pay for that. Last week, the Urban Renewal Commission chose not at this <coughs> time to move forward to give money to the Urban Renewal, uh, to the Urban Tinger House uh, rehab program. But um, they did say that um, come back later and they may revisit it but at this time they didn't want to move forward to provide any um, <coughs> renewal funding um, and that's to say that they didn't close the book um, but they wanted us to, to look at other funding before we came back to them so. um, what kind of shape is the house in now in preparation for the winter Good what question. if anything needs to be done to make sure that the damage doesn't the things that have been worse? done uh, there's been some internal shoring um, yeah. If you go in, especially the, um, if you go in the door, I'm going to explain this, the right front and rear uh, rooms now have uh, shoring uh, in the inside. Um, so it's um, basically a shoring wall is going through those two rooms. Uh, and um, all the windows uh, which were repaired have been stored and then f they removed the um, plywood and pl plexiglass in the windows. So you will notice that looks like they're um, windows are in but it's just a plexiglass um, enclosure but that's the initial um, first steps to look at shoring so the short term they feel pretty comfortable now I'm not an engineer and I can't comment on snow lows or things like this but they feel confident that some of the immediate concerns about the structural stability have been addressed through the um, recommendations of some of the structural mm -hmm. reports and leakage um, is taken care of for the time being as far as I know for the time being the long-term questions I, I don't have that answer okay. for the winter as long as for the winter we know it's not going to deteriorate any more than it has yeah. I think that yeah. it just popped in my head I, I vaguely remember Cindy sending an email saying that she was gone okay so I don't think that's her car I'm pretty <laughs> sure so anyway, uh, in, it just in popped the, in my head and the program that is uh, that I play for is the Kinsman Foundation and they're out of um, Milwaukee Gladstone and they do a lot of historic preservation work and so a $40,000 request has been turned in through the Kinsman, Kinsman Foundation That's for private. phase one and it's private Oh wow! so uh, we're looking forward to that and potentially 20,000 we're going to request as part of the um, 
uh, SHPO grant process, which is separate from our normal certified local government, and that uh, is applied for in the, in the fall. Okay. And then after that round, we'll be looking kind of the bigger, um, the next rounds of kind of the non-preservation related grant programs. Thank you. So we're moving forward slowly, but surely we're moving forward. Okay. Thank okay. you. Then the next one would be uh, the grant program. Yeah, 2011-2012 Preservation Grant Program. As you recall, we did not get funded through Metro Enhancement Grant, but we do have $5,000 through community development to keep this grant alive. Still looking for long-term future funding, but this year we do have $5,000. And so my recommendation is to continue what we did last year, which is keep the grants at 1000 Therefore, we can have five $1,000 grants and have uh, the applications restricted to new people till January 1 and then after January 1 let people who've pre previously applied but the rule of no more than three thousand dollars worth of grant money every two years mm -hmm. should still stay in place so that's my recommendation is to continue what we did last year we just from three thousand now have five thousand dollars did we use it all we use it all last oh, year I don't remember what's the period is it June to I mean is it the fiscal it starts September well when is it it we are granted through the fiscal year, but we generally didn't, don't start September. the application until September. Yeah, that's right. So I, um, what I've usually done is that in the month of August, I've, I've changed our website, updated the applications, and sent notice out to the community about uh, the new funding for the year. And then, in general, um, what's been working well is I've been giving a deadline sheet about each month that there's an HRB hearing and the deadline for turning an application in is X date. If you meet that, um, you are processed in the um, in the number which you came in. And so it's kind of a first come, first serve if you meet the requirements of the, the grant program. So one thing to ask is we did not have a requirement last year on the 60% of window rehab, 40% of building because we only had three thousand dollars so that's one thing to think about do you want to open it up for five one thousand dollar grants and it could be five one thousand dollar porch grants or do you want to limit a certain amount of money for window rehab because that was the original intent when we had more money in the grant program was that we always set aside a certain amount of money for window rehab I think it should go personally to whatever comes across the table you know I hate to deny somebody because they're doing a porch rehab because mm -hmm. it's only for windows, but yet that would be a viable enhancement. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's like somebody else has a thought. I think it made sense when we had more money and we were yeah. trying to play the program as more window repair, but I think people know it is a window repair mm -hmm. program, so I actually get less people knowing that they can use it for a siding repair or porch repair, and it's right. usually people coming in for windows just be happy to see people come and use it I mean something's happening so. what are the what's the source of the funds uh, previously we've had matched it with grant funding but the last two years we did not receive our matching grant funding so last year we had three thousand dollar from the community development general fund okay and we uh, upped it to five thousand this year from the community development general and fund. the source of the f uh, the matching funds that we didn't get was that is that a the metro enhancement program <coughs> yeah a, lot of money before. a little history is the year before we had the 3,000, we had 15,000, mm -hmm. but it was in the middle of a bad recession, and because it's a matching grant, people didn't have the funds to do right. the match, mm -hmm. and for that reason, we didn't use up the 15. Mm -hmm. And, and so that's the five that's left over. No, this no. was newly new, this new, new funds. Yeah. So I think we were cut out of the process because the funds weren't used, but there was a good reason the funds weren't used. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the first year we had a lot of money. And <laughs> so we've really changed. You know, the first year we had $29,000 mm -hmm. worth of uh, granting ability, and we didn't use all of it, but we, I think we ended up using about twenty. So, uh, you know, the, in, to me, in a perfect world, it would be nice to have about ten or 15000 mm -hmm. every year. So we need to find some type of long-term matching. And um, I haven't had much... Um, communication with the Kinsman Foundation and did not know kind of their historic preservation bent. So as I talk to them with Irma Tinger, I'm going to bring up and see if this is an opportunity for long term, but it's how do you get that long term funding mm -hmm. so uh, we don't have to um, really reapply every year and try to search and grab that extra funding or do we end up just staying at 5000 every year coming out of community development or is this something we ask through the city commission to find through their general fund. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, right this year we're talking about the preservation grant program and 
the recommendation, um, Derek Metzen just came into the meeting. Hello. Uh, the recommendation is to keep uh, with last year's uh, modifications, which kept it at a $1,000 grant. So you could give five $1,000 grants. Um, start in September to December, only give to people who have never been part of the grant program before. And after January, people who previously approved can come back. But we can't give more than $3,000 every two years. So that's the goal. So that's my recommendation uh, for this next year as well. And I can make modifications, and the first application can be heard in a September meeting. Cool. So if I can just maybe get a verbal direction that that's. Whatever you think's best. <laughs> so do you need a motion for that? I don't think no. so. But just no. uh, Sounds good to go me. Go do it. Okay. I agree. There, that's all I needed. Yeah. Okay, so we'll move forward with that. Um, so the next discussion item is the HRB goals and policies update. And I have a hard copy on your um, dais. And this is what was put together this spring. And this was looking at this spring, summer, and all of next year. And some of these you'll see are ongoing, especially kind of and specific projects that are finishing up. Uh, but as you get to four, five, six, and seven, these are future work session. And so one thing I'd like to do is maybe tackle one of these in September or October work session. So I wanted to get direction um, of what thing you want you would like to work on first for September or October work session. What would be getting. easier to schedule at this point? I think all if it just, what do you what do you care most about to work on? And I think all of these are doable, but I probably right now I just like to attack attack you know a, a address one kind of with vigor and maybe we need one to two work sessions. But let's kind of take one of these items and, and really address it to the point where it's the board feels it's been addressed. It may not hurt to maybe you, number four for people who don't know much about Windows on the board potential. I don't know that or five. Those seem like easy ones to schedule. Maybe um, I think six. We just keep doing what we're doing. Right. right. I think, and also uh, seven is, I mean, one of the big questions. Those were four uh, priorities. Are there any of the of policies you'd like to start addressing and discussing uh, at a work session? And I can, you know, any of these, I can bring background information to a PowerPoint. I can bring Carrie Richter in to talk a little background. I mean, I can create um, and provide additional reading. I mean, we can come to this work session with, and I can get you the, the background information you need to, to really discuss it in depth. It's just, I need to choose one to move forward with. Some of these are kind of, I don't know, development of properties abutting historic districts. We had discussion about that before, and that's a real. But it may know. be that that work session is done as a way to make a, a formal decision as a, as a board as well. I mean, that's one thing you can see it is if through the formal process, bringing the, the neighborhood association in, discussing it, looking at the pros and cons, looking at the costs, what are the cost-benefit analysis of it. Is this some, you know, you can make a formal decision that at this time the board would like to move forward with this or would not like to move forward, and that can be just a policy direction. We can do that now? Well, no, through a, a formal work session. <laughs> well, I this is a formal a work session. Notice anyway. to the neighbors with proper background information. <laughs> So I mean, that's one thing to think about. If you think there's well, something, we didn't give notice to say these are listed as potential priorities. Because yeah, we've done this, this as a public were, notice. These are these bottom been attached ones to um, the agenda. Oh, on mm -hmm. online. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think we should go with policy discussions. Which mm -hmm. one? Oh, we're not tackling all of them at one time. Yeah. No. <laughs> we'll tackle one. Well, I could. <laughs> I could easily bang at, them all out real fast. At one. But at, and to, not to yeah. sway you at all, but um, I, ha I did um, attend a meeting at the Stork Preservation League of Oregon last week, and they are tackling infill design standards, um, trying to help communities statewide to help them uh, beef up their infill design standards. And they were trying to come up with templates or blanket statements or policy guidelines or you know bigger pictures that community co communities could whittle down and use and after four hours there was no consensus <laughs> that's so, government so surprise. <laughs> no no these were pres these were preservation design professionals oh, good so i mean it's 
but what came out of it is it's a passion issue for a lot of communities mm -hmm. and there's no easy answers and after four hours of that meeting it came down to it depends and so I mean it's 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 a very um, topical question so um, and it is wow. definitely on, on my uh, thought processes last week and I know uh, previous um, uh, HRB members such as Ken Basinger that was an important issue that he wanted to pursue and I know he was a proponent of putting this on as a um, priority and one thing that I wondered as I sat and listened to the discussions that just kept talking about well it's all about context and this and that and when can this happen when when's it okay for something really modern to be there when's it okay for something really big when's it okay you know it was four hours of talking about when something okay in, in, within the context of a specific dis district uh, I wondered if our existing adopted design guidelines don't have a specific enough section or page that talks about when you want to depart from these adopted standards what is the process an applicant should go through and what's the process the community historic review board should look at a, a reviewing alternatives that may not specifically meet the checkoff box of our design standards but may also be appropriate we don't we just talk about how these design standards are safe harbors but we don't talk about when you are leaving the safe harbor and as an applicant what do you need to come to the table with if you are proposing an alternate or something that may not specifically meet the design standards but you think is compatible what what are what are the expectations of the community and board on how you make your presentation or what information you provide or how you think about your process I don't think we have that in the design standards and that was one thing that was discussed a little bit we just generally have a three to four sentences in the front part of the document that says this is a safe harbor this doesn't say you can't do something that's not in the documents dot 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 by the way here's the rest of the document so that would be one thing we may want to look at is how do we enhance our existing design guidelines to maybe work walk people through that process if they wanted to do an alternate hmm. uh, so that that might be one option and look at or are we happy with what we have I mean that may be that may be after a whole work session and looking at all the issues and maybe we're happy with what we have I mean that could be the answer too yeah. um, but you know after last year's appeal with the Atkinson Church there seemed to be a percentage of the neighbor association and even some of the stroke review board members they felt that there wasn't as much clear direction on, on how to review that application on our design guidelines was that from the owner or the uh, community no, I think it was from the community through the appeal okay. process. I mean, when you pay for an appeal, you are saying that. I mean, there's definitely the, the neighbors. And then I think I heard some frustration from the board a little bit about do our design guidelines adequately address an addition such as this? So, I mean, it's, it was a good test case. And did, did our design guidelines do their job, or do they need to be revised to address these type of issues? And, no, I, and I don't know the answer. I don't know if I have I think a it's just a matter of education. You know, when you get heated but, and emotional. But, so, but our design guidelines are all about education, so do we need to add another page that continues that education? But it's not education with the board so much as the public. Right. And that may be an addition of a page but, to the design standards. It may not be through the design standards, but possibly on the website. Um, so it's not um, necessarily a process the applicant would have to go through, but um, just to make the requirements or the expectations, I think, that would be the best word the expectations um, clear mm -hmm. um, to the city as far as what's being required of that applicant and I think we do that but it's more of a it's so, more of a the burden of proof and have you truly made I think it's two things really letting the applicant know that when you leave the safe harbor the burden is really on you to make your case I mean it's always on you as an applicant but it's really on you now to make your case and it also may allow community expectations that there may be alternatives that may not meet these design standards that go through a type 3 public hearing process where these issues are deliberated that can still be appropriate it's more of just saying you know this is a type 3 discretionary process and we've created 
design guidelines that will hopefully get you there pretty easily, but it doesn't exclude another design. And maybe it's just that education aspect, so there's an expectation from the community. Because I felt, you know, in, in some sense, the people that were appealing felt that the design guidelines were almost a codification. So if you did not specifically meet everything, they, they, they felt that the design guidelines were not being met. I mean, that's why they appealed it. And so, what? but what is, I don't think is there something that needs to be a change with the design guidelines? So I'm, I'm a little confused. Mm -hmm. um, so on the one side, people who may propose are feeling uncomfortable because they feel like what we have in guidelines are sort no, of. I don't believe that. I, no. But a, a, maybe a potential applicant. No, I don't think any, any existing No, applicant. potential applicant. Yeah. And if you feel, may feel that the guidelines are sort of in stone, and you call it safe harbor. So they don't know how they can venture away from those. On the board side, or decision making, uh, not real clear about how we would evaluate this options that may move away from the guidelines. So, that, so there's sort of this double feeling of unease. And third, um, third, from the community, what's the expectation? Okay. So I think those are all three questions, <clears throat> and I'm wondering if even a paragraph needs to be added to the design guidelines that addresses some of these, or a page, or, or maybe something that's not, you know, the actual document's not adopted, but maybe there's an educational page. I mean, that's, that might be the work session, is just kind of really working through the items and hearing from the community as a check-in with the community. Mm -hmm. okay. is an this educational something that, disclaimer. Is this, is this something that you, McLaughlin Neighborhood Association, you know, residents of McLaughlin Neighborhood, residents of Kanema, is this, is this an issue that, that, that you feel needs to be addressed? Because, I mean, it's, it's not just the board's design guidelines. These were created through a really collaborative process with members of both neighborhood associations. I mean, so there's some ownership with these design guidelines. Uh, vested interests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it all came down to not in my backyard mentality. It didn't matter how much they knew. That's what we yeah. were fighting exactly. that whole time. And that was the anger and the emotion that came with that and the appeal. Those people weren't educated. Yeah. They didn't want to get educated on the process. They were just ticked off. That's all it was. That's but was there more than that, though? Well, then you start getting into this, let's well, do this question. and so let's do that. If someone wants to do a, if, if I own a building, I own a vacant lot on 7th Street, and I come to the Stork Review Board with a pretty modern design, but the massing's all right, the materials are all historic, but it's a more of a modern interpretation of an historic building. So it really straddles the line. Do you think our design standards are set up so the board, if you were if you were reviewing this application, which was a kind of modern interpretation of historic building, all the math scenes are correct, but it's definitely more towards the modern side, that you feel that our design standards are set up the way you could approve that and find that it was compatible? That's a good question. I think it really depends on... Well, you should have been here last week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the community's view on it. Because mm -hmm. you have towns like Sisters where everything has to look like it's straight out of the 1800s mm -hmm. Western Which is not a historic town. town. I mean, it's a creative history. Which is exactly. McDonald's. And, and <laughs> if, if we go that route, we're going to be recreating history, which isn't necessarily within the Department of Interior Standards. Um, whereas happens. what you described, where it respects the historic structure, um, but is reflective of what the current time is, um, is within those standards, you'd have something more like the Alberta District or Hawthorne, mm -hmm. where you run down that road, and there are some war modern structures, a lot of renovations, but you can tell it's not a new neighborhood. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that was brought up at the meeting last week, which I think is a really good point about w when, and I say modern buildings, and that's a big encompassing definition, yeah. uh, when in context they may be more appropriate, they, some of, someone came up with two star startling different situations. One, you have a very specific, you have a very coherent row house um, and buildings in Soho, and you have one opening, and someone wants to do a really modern building, but you know all the all the building floor levels are the same and the massing's the same, but it's really modern materials. That might be fine because your context is so overwhelmingly historically intact mm -hmm. that that one historic building, you know, plays and re uh, respects it, but. It's so. It's always going to be secondary because the street is so historically intact. 
Or you have something like the Yamhill Historic District, which is a cast iron historic district with lots of parking lots. Well, if every single one of those parking lots were built with a four-story Mercy Corps building, do you still have the historic land, uh, Yamhill Historic District with cast iron buildings? So how many teeth you have, holes in your, te in your um, te teeth make a difference of, and maybe how appropriate modern infill may be. So that was a discussion of, it's all about context as well. I think this would be a great topic rather than do window repair, which we seem to fall back on quite a bit. Um, I think it's, on and on. this could go on and on, <laughs> but it would be nice to uh, gauge the feelings of the neighborhood, to educate people, to find out what people feel, um, especially in light of the fact, um, even though the economy is still not very good, um, the costs, construction costs that were going up, up, up are, in, and interest rates and construction costs are, are pretty manageable now. And when I look at at least the McLaughlin Historic District, you look at 7th Street, you see the Olson Drug Building, which is just a shell. You see so many other places where there's vacancies where they really could use some infill. Mm -hmm. which we could get ready for it. Excuse me? Oh, sorry, good. Um, and perhaps if we had a read on things, if we did need to change our rules, maybe it would inspire some people who okay. don't feel comfortable at this point because they don't really know what the rules are or how it would fit in. Mm -hmm. It would inspire people to take some risks and do some things that could encourage economic development, which mm -hmm. would be really good for the, for the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we could talk about it all night, but I think maybe yeah. so. We I mean, I can I can look at that for a September October sure. work session and kind of what I see, and, it, and maybe it's broken up into two months. And um, but we've given you background. Um, I might even give you bring up some of the other issues that were discussed last week. What are what are kind of all the issues out in regards to m development that that's a little bit more non traditional. Um, and how other communities deal with it, how this, you know, the Secretary of Interior standards are for rehabilitating and creating additions onto historic buildings. The Secretary of Interior specifically it's not, has not created infill standards because it is so context specific. So they stay away from that and they let the local communities do that, but a lot of local communities are so small or not adequately prepared to look at that kind of hyper context. And so that's kind of what the Historic Preservation League of Oregon is trying to help with. But it's bringing up all these issues, which are, right. it depends on the context. And so I, maybe we need to have that conversation. So I, I can look at that for September, October, definitely. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, citywide Historic Survey update. Yeah. Um, if you remember, uh, phase two started this summer, which was because we did not receive um, any private property owners uh, who wanted to sign on for local designation. Um, we tried to use that money towards two um, buildings owned by the city, and so the elevator and the promenade were chosen. So what we're doing for the money that, um, I think it's only about three or $4,000, but the um, pre painter preservation, Chris Ann Beckner and Diana Painter, are taking that money and helping us do some research and physical descriptions that could be later used on a future National Register nomination, which I think is great. What I'm trying to get them to do is all the things that I couldn't do. You know, I'm not uh, uh, skilled in writing architectural descriptions, especially something like the elevator and the promenade, which is not a traditional, mm. you know, building for elevation description. Uh, so trying to work with them on what are things that they can do for those three to $4,000 that I can build upon at a later date when we have time to, to nominate because both of them are eligible for National Register listing. The only reason they've not been listed is time and staff, staff time. And whenever there's certified local government grants, we always use our grant money for other projects because we already treasure those two. They're already locally designated. You know, National Register status is not going to get tax credits for the city. I mean, it's just a pride issue for National Register nomination. For Section 106 and, and Federal Review of Compatibility, they're considered eligible for listing, so they're treated as if they were eligible when any, any program's done with them. So it's just pure pride that we would ever do this, but it's a nice to say we have two very important city-owned properties, the elevator, which is you know a vertical street and very unique for the owned by a city, and the promenade, which is a beautiful, newly restored WPA rock. <coughs> so they're, they're great. Does the promenade 
include the grand staircase? They do. Yeah. It's all considered promenade grand staircase is mm -hmm. all kind of one package. And they've both been, so that's the goal is what I can get and then when there's future time to try to move forward with national register listing. So I'm trying to get them to do the hard stuff. <laughs> okay. uh, and the final thing I have direction tonight um, before we retire f uh, and adjourn is just trying to get the pulse and direction from the board on a previous application. And I received it today and this is one of those, things, oh, I need the, We can see it. See it yeah, we can okay. the Atkinson. Yeah. All right, so this is for the Atkinson Memorial Church Edition. And unfortunately, I did not print out the, the email today, but what Paul Fulcetta from Carlton Hart asked, and this is from the original May application, but I think it can still illustrate my question to the board. Okay. Uh, he was requesting to have the side panel. If you see the um, segmented square panels, those have been changed to lap siding as part mm -hmm. of that. The, yeah. the, but they had still had that light um, uh, brown color. He'd like to change it all so all the lap siding is the same color. And I, on a staff level, um, so the bump outs everything's um, the same are not differentiated with different color. Mm -hmm. Uh, on a staff level, I normally would approve this because it was not part of the double deliberations at all. The, the historic review board didn't really talk about the color scheme. Uh, personally, I think it, um, we're trying to lessen the impact of the addition and trying to make it visually go away and keep the keep historic the building as prominent as possible. Well, I mean, that does, mm -hmm. uh, that does that. So I think it's moving cl closer towards that. Uh, but because it was appealed and it was contentious, I wanted to bring it back to the board for direction. If that was um, something the board wanted to give me further direction on. On a staff level, I'd recommend uh, approval because I think it, now the, where the stucco is, the, the this dark red, that's still stucco and that's that transition zone right. from the historic mm -hmm. building. That's fine. Transition, that's still a different color and then it moves into the lap siding. And, and that would be one color. I mean, with, with the trim, I'm saying the trim is it's still all trimmed out. With, with yeah, but that's fine. Color. I mean, from my perspective, being there with all of this, that's fine. It kind of makes it dissolve a little mm -hmm. more. So I agree. That's okay. a staff thing. And I, I normally would be a staff, but because this was contentious and appealed, right. I wanted, and because I received the email today and I knew I'd be meeting this evening, <laughs> it was an easy <laughs> request to make. So. And by the way, um, I've been watching the construction very closely, and I just think it looks great. It looks as good as I thought it would when we saw it on paper, and I went past it on Jefferson the other day, and I just don't think that that Jefferson Street side is obtrusive in any way. It just blends right in. Yeah, I mean, they absolutely got the massing right. Mm -hmm. The question of architectural style, that's, I think, what October is about. Because I think they, yeah, they absolutely got the massing correct. Well, keep this, let them do their color thing. If the neighbors have a stink, it's Vicky's problem. <laughs> no, I, no, because I did bring it back, at, and now granted it wasn't noticed, yeah. but I am bringing it back to the board, cause yeah. it, and because it wasn't specifically deliberate, it was never through the whole process of deliberation issue, so. No worry. All right. Okay. That is all I have, so. Then we uh, can adjourn. Yep. At about 640. <laughs>